Ladies and gentlemen, independent Americans around the country, around the world, happy summer, happy pride, happy Independence Day week. It is a wild fucking time in America, a wild time in the world. And I am very happy to bring to you a guest that I admire, that I think is a rising star in America and beyond, and is a perfect person to take us through a variety of stuff happening in this moment. I'm proud to finally welcome the great and powerful Lindsay Church to Independent Americans. Welcome, Lindsay. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. I'm glad to be here. Um, so we talk a lot about what's going on in the world. And uh, I think you're a rock star. I think you're a rising star. And that's one of the reasons why I'm excited to talk to you. Um, but let's start in the moment with the question I ask everyone, because I see a 12th man jersey over your shoulder. Uh, where are you and how are you? I am in Seattle, Washington. Um, I am probably just like everybody else in the world, a little confused, a little hurt, and a little numb. Um, the, it's been a wild time to be alive, as you said, and just glad to be breathing. Mm. Yeah, the alternative sucks, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so I want to get into the breaking news about Torres versus uh, Texas uh, Department of Safety, the Supreme Court decision. I want to talk about Roe. I want to talk about uh, the January 6 hearings. Um, I want to talk about all of it. Um, but let's talk about you for a second, because you're a person that I think is rising to this moment. How did you get to this moment? How did you become an activist leading an advocacy organization in the middle of this crazy time and world? Yeah, that's an interesting story. We, uh, so I'm the co-founder and executive director of Minority Veterans of America. We started in 2017. Uh, what I like to call Trump's greatest hits. Um, 2017 was the first women's march. Um, mass mobilizations in the street. It was also the Muslim ban. It was also the trans ban. Uh, we started 12 days after the military trans ban. Uh, I myself am a LGBTQ uh, veteran and served under Don't Ask, Don't, Ask, Don't Tell. Um, myself and my co-founder both had been involved in the veteran community through Student Veterans of America. I was the commander of an American Legion post. Um, and let me tell you, that was just toxic as you would imagine. Uh, after the trans ban, I think there was a moment of like, I've had enough. You've had enough. Uh, my Korean, my uh, my co-founder is a Korean American woman veteran. Between the two of us, we knew something had to change, and that we had more power, but that we were living in fractured communities. And the veteran community is very uh, fractured in a lot of ways. But identity related, um, it, it's really toxic for racial and ethnic minorities, women, LGBTQ folks, and religious and non-religious minorities. What we started to understand is that we have more power than they allow us to think that we do, because there are communities that exist for one pocket of these of minority groups, right? That like there's groups that serve racial and ethnic minorities. There are groups that serve women. There are groups that serve LGBTQ folks and religious minorities. And they're so small that we can't create this collective action movement. And so in 2017, via text message, because, you know, the millennials, um, what else? Millennials start, start organizations through a text message with a swear word in it and said, actually, I think we could do something here. Um, I will never understand what it feels like to live in your body and you will never understand what it feels like to live in mine. But what we do understand is marginalization and oppression, whether it be in service or after service. And that if we come together to create this collective action movement, we actually might be able to move the needle. And so in 2017, 12 days after the trans ban, after the Muslim ban, after the first um, um, modern you know, restrictions on abortions, we came together and said, we're gonna create an organization and we're gonna create a movement um, and we're gonna organize and we're gonna fight the system. We're also at the same time gonna create this community where we can actually belong and we, where we can be a part of something and that we can heal while we mobilize at the same time. So five years ago, half a decade, we'll turn five on August 7th. Um, a lot has changed. We started as an adversary movement. We started as like a challenger that nobody really wanted in this space and thought that we were just here to yell and scream. But actually, here we are five years later and we have very legitimate reasons for doing the things that we've done. And we have moved the system and the community in a lot of ways that I don't know that five years ago you would have seen. So that's part of why I think your, uh, your voice and your organization are so important is because you're a disruptor. And I see a lot of the early days of what we created in IABA and what you're creating in MVA now. Um, and you know, the organization I found it went from kind of being a disruptor and is now almost, some would argue, part of the establishment, right? 
And now we sit at the table with, with the VA secretary. Um, you know, they get big grants from established nonprofits. They're professionalized, all that stuff. But the core of what I think is most important right now is, is your voice and your personal experience and your dynamism. You served uh, as an LGBTQ person under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, I, want to, I want to just focus on that for a moment yes. if I can, um, because how did that shape um, your perspective? Because a lot of folks will leave the military community, will leave the veterans community. You talked about being a commander of the American Legion. I can't think of a more hostile environment in many ways, right? Um, you kind of went into the belly of the beast here after leaving the belly of the beast. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like? Absolutely. Um, so I served under Don't Ask, Don't Tell all but three months. Um, so I literally, came, I, I was a part of the military and served under a policy at the like Defense Language Institute where they had done a sting of linguists that were LGBTQ and kicked them out of a drone nest hotel. I lived in a community that literally feared at all times being criminalized, kicked out and their lives ruined. Um, and at the same time, I was also trying to serve my country. I was also trying to survive, um, you know, multiple surgeries. I was medically retired, lived through hell on earth many times over and didn't have the appropriate support and always feared that I would be kicked out and my whole life change and be ruined. Um, when I got out of the military, I, I didn't know what to do or how to do it. Um, I chose to go back to school and I like kind of lived solo. My mom was a veteran. Uh, my family comes from military. So I talk a lot about this uh, two parts of your identity, right? That when you serve under don't, ask, under don't Ask, Don't Tell, it's like you create two people. One of them is your military self. This like, you know, the straight white Christian male and everything else is cut off. Um, this like uniform that you put on. And there's the queer part of yourself that's like liberated and like living as a regular person, like get to look like this and like not be treated differently. And so when you get out, it's like you created compartmentalization, but like an actual fracture of your identity. I was sitting at a pod, I was sitting in a um, session once with somebody that was teaching a session on the lasting legacy of don't ask, don't tell. And I was sitting there listening to her say, that it's like you have two parts of yourself and two parts of you, two people, one body. And I was, my mind was blown. I was like, wow, I didn't even realize I was doing that, that there was a veteran part of myself and there was an LGBTQ part of myself. I was only a veteran for a very long time. And I accidentally stumbled into this round table with a mayoral candidate here in Washington state. And I thought I was going to be the token veteran or that being going to be the token queer on a veteran round table. I was actually the token veteran on a queer round table. And it broke me. I was so like, I was, I was like, I don't know how to be queer. I don't know how to be queer and a veteran. Like that was the wildest experience. And from there, I really had to basically like break this curtain down within myself and with my own identity. Um, I am divorced. My first wife and I had a very tough relationship, even though we great people, but you create this part of yourself that you can't let somebody into it. So the scars of that policy continue to live in my life. And then you hear other people and it's the same story over and over and over consistently, two parts of my identity. I have a divorce. I couldn't make, you know, keep marriages going. I couldn't keep relationships going, you know, suicidal ideations, all of these things come from this part of yourself where you served, all you want to do is serve your country. All you want to do is serve your, serve your, the people that you love, but you can't, and it breaks you. Well, it didn't completely break you because. No, you, it just made you, me angry. <laughs> yeah, major anger, which is, which is, you know, this used to be called angry Americans. We're fine with that. Um, but it's about turning that anger into positive impact and being stronger at the broken places. And that's what I see now in you. But let me ask you, I, I feel like every pride month is different. It's like every 9-11 is different. Every Memorial Day is different. It happens in a different context. It's happening now when extremists are openly threatening and attacking Pride events. It's happening in the backdrop of the January 6th uh, uh, hearings. Um, it's happening as Roe v. Wade is overturned. I want to I want to pull apart a couple of those pieces, but I want to ask you to be uh, Professor Lindsay, if you can. Right? You were you talked about this Clark Kent super person. I'm not going to say Superman. Right? So we have these this dual duality. But um, you know, folks are afraid to ask questions. And I think this community is diverse. Independent Americans talks to a lot of people. Can you break it down for folks and explain what is queer? Uh, what is non-binary? Why do you um, prefer to be called or asked to be called they instead of something else? Can you take us through those three pieces as a 
as a teachable moment, please? Yeah, let's start. Let's let's break it down. All right. So people often talk about this alph- alphabet soup, right? This like ever growing LGBTQ IA two spirit. Now, what we're trying to name is every single sexual and gender minority in a, in an acronym. And actually, what we're talking about is sexual orientation and gender identity. Those are the two things within the LGBTQ nomenclature that we're talking about. The reason why I use queer is because my gender identity isn't binary. So lesbian, gay, bisexual means that you identify as man or woman, you are attracted to man or woman. So therefore these binaries exist, but there are many people that are attracted to just a person or understand that like they might be attracted to a trans person, they identify as pan or they identify as queer. For me, being queer is a part of my gender identity and my sexual orientation all wrapped up into one. Um, So my gender identity is non-binary. I don't believe in binaries. I think they're stupid. Um, Boxes that we put ourselves into. I mean, we're sitting here independent Americans, right? Like think about your, somebody broke this down and I thought it was the funniest and simplest way to think about it. If um, California is man and New York is woman, I'm somewhere around Iowa. Like there's this balance and this like, um, I don't believe that binary boxes were meant for us, that we actually created them in the same way that we created race, that we created sexual orientation, gender identity, like all of these things were created to put us in boxes as like a, as a tactic to like one societal control, but also like to help us reduce and eliminate fear. And as a non-binary person, I use they and them pronouns because I don't identify as he or she. Um, I love living my life outside of the binary. I love that like, I'm not beholden to society's expectations. And I think that binaries need to go away. We put these kids, even we, the same thing we think, I think about kids, right? That we put kids in boxes very quickly and very early. We give them blue, we give them pink, we call them tomboys, we call them sissies, we call them fairies. Like we literally, are transphobic to our own kids because we still think that they have to meet these cultural norms. What I actually wanna ask people more than what people are asking me is, why does it make sense that you wear pink because you have something between your, between your pants that, that you should wear pink? Like there's a point of this that like is actually over-sexualizing and, and really inappropriately gendering people based off of what you think is in their pants, which is like the most awkward, weird, strange thing that we do as a culture. And for me, I'm not, I'm just not going to be complicit in anymore. Um, I would like to live my life in any way that I can without this rigid expectation of who I am, what I wear, how I talk, what I do, and how I succeed in the world. Um, Let me tell you, it's not that simple. Um, It's definitely the lived experience. Can I pause you there? Yeah. First of all, thank you. Thank you for your, um, for your grace and, and your patience in explaining this. But I think it's important for people to have um, multiple ways to understand this and voices to explain it. And it's a hard question. Like a lot of people, especially conservative independent people, maybe don't want to ask if you're not in the progressive space, if you're not in the movement space, if some of the language you're using, Lindsay, is new to people when you talk about movement theory and these things that I know from organizing but are newer to other people. I think it's really important. You're, you're also... Um, touching on something really important that I think fits well with this uh, show and this community, which is none of the above. You're taking agency, right? You're saying, I'm going to define myself. I won't be defined by the construct in the same way we've talked with John Opdyke. It may be a reach, but I don't think it is. You know, you don't have to be uh, bipartisan. You can be nonpartisan. You can be none of the above. You don't have to choose Democrat or Republican or independent party. You can, you're kind of unaffiliated. Right. Yes. And politically, I think that's why I wanted to explore this, because I think there is overlap. People who, who, who are uh, who have a very clear or firm or strong or, or passion um, sense of their identity, um, I think, are probably more politically independent, too. And I think for a long time, it's been assumed that they're going to be Democrats uh, and that the Republicans are going to drive them away, which they have been. But I'm also saying, hey, there's also another option, which is none of the above. And in a time where it seems like, especially in the last two weeks, more Democrats are recognizing the inadequacy of the Democratic Party than ever before, this is a moment. So I want to take that conversation forward with you because Roe has now happened. And I'm going to pause and say, if folks, if you hear noise behind me, I'm sorry, my neighbor has decided now to mow the lawn. Um, Welcome to summer in Rykoff land. Um, But I want to ask you, Roe's impact on the military is significant and happening right now. Um, Can you break down for folks, what is the immediate impact of Roe being overturned for the military, which is active duty people and our national security and the veterans community, which is different, which is folks like me and you that are out 
Can you break down, in your view, the immediate impact of how Roe is impacting these communities? Absolutely. Um, I've been trying to break this down for a lot of folks recently that the Roe falling is a, one of the biggest threats to national security that we as a country face right now. Um, we already know that recruitment and retention is a, an all time like threat. We know that all of the recruiting numbers, the metrics that we define success by are trending in the wrong direction when it comes to recruitment and retention. You now have service members for the first time in all volunteer history women cannot access and gender minorities cannot access abortion services for the first time since the all volunteer forces. That's a, that's a big piece of history. Now you have also have a high concentration of service members stationed in states where they no longer have access or very soon will have curtailed access or not at all. The V or the department of defense only allows for exceptions, right? The, the um, TRICARE only covers exceptions of rape, incest and, um, and threat to the life of, of the mother. It's one thing we talk a lot about sexual assault and sexual harassment and the idea that sex, that people in the military are disproportionately likely, likely to be sexually assaulted, sexually harassed, and have un, unwanted pregnancies. And people also don't want to report. So even if you are raped and you have access through TRICARE, information going to service members, um, access to those services, being believed that you are raped or sexually assaulted, and that's the reason why you're pregnant, you are going to see that 28% of our forces are now going to uh, 28% of our forces being women are now going to not have access to the very basic needs that they have. Readiness is going to be to diminish. Um, access for family members if anybody needs it. Um, so it's not just military, it's also military families. Now, when you look at recruitment, recruitment and retention numbers, I keep trying to say that 18 to 25 year old men should actually be as terrified as women getting pregnant because when you start to see these numbers diminish, you will start to see that the, the idea of the draft comes back. Now, women tried to appeal to the Supreme Court last year to be concluded, included in the draft, and they said, absolutely not. So even gender parity in the draft doesn't exist. So when those numbers continue to trend, and let me tell you, organizers will continue to do recruitment stand downs, and it will continue to push that and push that needle because it's not equitable, it's not safe, and it's not, it's not welcoming for our service members. Culture continues to change and continues to want to push those people out. So. If you don't like military service, you should be fighting for Roe and the protections that it had as much as women and gender minorities that can get pregnant. Okay. So I want to pull one piece of that apart, Lindsay. So you're an 18 year old woman in New York uh, and you join the, the army or the Navy like you did and you get stationed in Kentucky, mm -hmm. right? You don't have the same rights as a, as a, as a service member in the active duty in Kentucky that you do as a civilian in New York, right? And not to mention the morale impact where, uh, you know, people right now are concerned about this. The, the DOD now has to formulate a response instead of thinking about Russian missiles. Um, right. It's a massive, um, you, know, you know, wrench in the system um, at a time when we really can't afford it. So I think the long-term strategic impact on the military, which also will kind of right wingify the military a little more, Mm -hmm. Right. Like like liberal people are now looking at the military going, well, the military sounds a lot more like Kentucky than it does like California, which I think is also 100%. really dangerous for the diversity of of our recruiting. You you you've also been really vocal and focused on the Department of Veterans Affairs when folks get out. You had a great uh, Twitter thread that I shared about the things the VA needs to do. And let's talk about that. If we can go over to the other camp, which is the largest federal health care system in America right? Access by tens of millions of, of people across this country. What is VA getting wrong uh, and what do they need to do? Not just on, on Roe, because I think that's important, but also more broadly for LGBTQ veterans, uh, since it's pride and in general, we should be talking about, but I want to use the pride opportunity because you've highlighted it to say, hey, VA keeps talking about how you know great they are on pride, but it looks like they're not. Yeah. Um, so first and foremost, going to abortion, VA has one of the restrictive or the most restrictive abortion laws on on record of any federal agency. So already a service member could get out if they were raped or sexually assaulted in the Department of Defense. When they, if they leave the military, they will no longer have access to abortion services, even in the cases of exceptions for for on this on the VA side. So that's number one, like service members would not have access if they transitioned. On the, on the pride side, let's just start this at the very beginning. We don't collect information on sexual orientation and gender identity. 
It is not mandated. We've been asking for this for years for them to collect the, the sheer number of people that have served that are LGBTQ. When you look at the number, it, how many times have you heard the number 1 million LGBTQ veterans? Like a lot, a lot. Like everybody, every department, every agency uses that number. Do you know that that number dates back to 1999? Do you know that I wasn't even out, uh, out of the closet at that point? Like I am now a veteran. I wasn't even out of the closet till 2000. And There's plenty of people that, that weren't born at that time. Yeah, exactly. Born, like, yeah. Tell me more about how there are only 1 million LGBTQ veterans because we are now in a time where service members are the most sexual and, and gender identity, like a diverse that they've ever been. Somehow that number hasn't moved in 20 years. We have no idea even the baseline information about a person's sexual orientation and gender identity. How do you fix a system without even knowing who people are and being able to identify trends in suicide and homelessness and any of the epidemics that we continue to see in our community, we have no idea about what's happening to the LGBTQ community. So data collection is number one. There's also no center for LGBTQ veterans. It's coordinating all of the DVA, the VA's responses for LGBTQ service members. So it doesn't, there's no, in the, like, there's no actual like coordinated body that's solely responsible for that. There's no, there's a center for women veterans is a center for minority veterans. So it's not an LGBTQ um, equivalent. There's also no advisory committee that's looking at sexual orientation and gender identity. There's also no gender affirming surgery, though the secretary continues to say we're very close. Every answer even now, they made the announcement over a year ago. And even now, the answer continues to be really, really close, which is great, but that's not information. You can't make an announcement and continue to make announcements about something that's happening that's not going to happen for another couple of years. Can we pause there for a second, Lindsay? Because I know Absolutely. there's a lot to, to work through here. Um, and you're you're brilliant on this. And, and this is why I wanted you on the show, because you're expert probably more than anybody in America, definitely more than most. Um, there's also the bigger issue, which is we can't even get them to change the motto, right? We've ha, talked on this show. About right. There, there's a VA motto that excludes everybody except men, right? Yes. Uh, we have been pushing for that. You know, it's two years in the Biden presidency. This has been an easy win right out of the gate. But they're digging in and they're bullshit. There's the feeling that they're just saying they, they, they're doing what I call shut the fuck up meetings where they'll give you, hey, we're working on it. We're working on it. We're coming back. Come, and, and then you're, you're off for three months and you're pushed back for six yes. months. Now it's going on two years, right? Yes. We're going into three years and, and they're not moving the ball on even the easy thing. So can, can I ask you, without getting into details, what's the resistance? Like, you know, I, what, where do you think the resistance comes from? Because we know the secretary himself can do it. So I'm going to put it on him and say, Secretary Dennis McDonough can change this. The president can change it. Why do you think those two people haven't changed it? I honestly, like I, I, there's a lot of theories that I have in my mind and I honestly can't come up with one that makes enough sense to have pushed off some of these things so much. You, you, you point to the motto and we've done everything that we're supposed to. And it's like at this point where it's like, okay, so you held meetings on, on strategic planning with all of the VSOs and asked them for their input on the motto. You did a, you did a survey back in March and we haven't seen any of that data. You've done, we've done literally everything that you have asked and we still see no movement. So the, the reality of the situation, I can't figure out why we're still here. I can't figure out why, unless it's that the competing priorities of everything else matter more because we've been yelling and screaming about all of these issues since as long as we've been an organization. My first time testimony, we tested, we started in 2017. The first time I testified on abortion rights was 2019. People have been testifying on this stuff for, for a long, 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 long time, but nobody wanted to move the needle or move the ball unless it's reactive. It's, it seems as though, as, just as, a, as though it was a prior administration or an adversarial administration, we still have to organize. We still have to yell. We still have to push for the things that we shouldn't have to yell about anymore. It shouldn't take that you, that you have completely eliminated our identities from the motto and we have to continue to look at it every single time we walk through for you to understand that it's time to move the motto. But it seems as though we still have to do the thing where we have to yell and scream and prove that this is a problem for them to actually address it unless it's in the media. They won't do it on their own. To explain that point, the motto is on the wall of every building. Mm -hmm. So it's like walking into Starbucks and seeing every time you walk in, there it is. It's not just like a little thing. It's on every building. It's the thing you see that says, you know, for for. Uh, for he and uh, for his orphan, right? For him and yes. for his orphan. 
Does it to care for any- him who has, shall have borne the battle and his widow and his orphan. Multiple times, they tell you that you don't count. They don't, you, you don't exist. And I just, I want to get onto this from a political standpoint. And then we got to try to blast through a couple other things. But the VA, even more than DOD, seems like the most moderate, maybe even conservative part of the, of the Biden administration. I just want to throw that out because I don't I don't know if you're a Democrat or you're an independent. I know you're you know, you're obviously active and you you have progressive values. But this is a head scratcher. You've got a white guy who's not even of our community. Right. There's nothing about us without us. I don't think you could not have you know, it's, it's literally like putting a Supreme Court justice up there who's never practiced law or head of education who's never taught or a secretary of defense who's never served. It's really shocking and it's it, it, it's a reality, but it seems like the most moderate or even secretly conservative, especially socially or in terms of equity is the VA. Does that seem right to you? It, it does. And also like it, it makes perfect sense when you think about it. The folks that made policy for the Department of Defense moved over as if their career progression was the Department of Veterans Affairs. Same people that made policy for DOD are now the policymakers for VA, or they're the VSOs yelling and screaming. The secretary is beholden to congressionally chartered VSOs. They, they are, he's actually required to meet with them and hear from them. You're also hearing from the most conservative part of our community on a regular basis. So these ideas I feel like are backed up because even when you ask VSOs within the community, what is, what's your position? What are you willing to do for Roe and to protect women, women and birthing humans for their reproductive rights? So the answer is nothing. The answer is we don't touch that. We don't talk about that. So it actually, it makes perfect sense when you think about it because you have a more moderate v, like VA secretary or a secretary that's trying to pace themselves. And you have VSOs that are more conservative leaning, pushing them and reiterating that this actually isn't a priority. While we as like little tiny fl- like flies that they would rather see go away sometimes have to yell and scream and rally our communities for them to even see that we exist. Okay, so um, context. If you hear the, I don't know if folks can hear the lawnmower, but like today it's like is very, the day, very okay, tiny. So the lawnmower, and speaking of flies, there's also a fly in my garage. So, like, welcome to fucking independent media. Um, but I, I want to build off of that because it's also happening in an environment where, you know, the LGBT community is literally being killed, right? Um, the, the right wing groups like the Patriot Front have said they will target pride events. They have targeted pride events. And the January 6th hearing is happening. We're hearing about the Oath Keepers. You're seeing the mobilization. You see what they look like. There's not a lot of diversity there. Right. It's a lot of angry white men who look like uh, a lot of, of the leaders we see in, in communities across the country. Um, so can you take a bigger step back? Like this is a really dangerous environment. But can you talk about what it's like for you personally? Because this row is not an abstract thing for you. These threats are not abstract things for you. They impact you and your family. So can you put that into into human terms for folks who maybe don't get it or haven't heard it? Yeah, let me let me break this down. Um, I there's no conver- there's no queer family in the country. I think that isn't having a really tough conversation right now. Um, I'm married to a beautiful, lovely woman that lives in Richmond, Virginia. I'm not at home, but she is also carrying our first child. Um, so. One, we got married like less than a month after RBG died because we were terrified we were going to lose our rights, that we were not going to have the right to marriage. Now, here we are two years later, and we're having a child in the time that Roe v. Wade falls. And while it may seem like Roe v. Wade falling doesn't impact us because we wanted our child and we literally planned and did all the things, if something happens to my wife, I have to be scared and we have to figure out how is she going to get the care that she needs. Um, we also live in a state with a constitutional ban against gay marriage. So should anything happen to Obergefell and Obergefell before my child is born, I might not be able to adopt my child. We're literally trying to figure out at this moment, whether we stay in the state of Virginia and fight like hell, because that's what I know how to do. That's what I've done my whole life. But now I have a kid. Now I have a child that I don't want to live fleeing. We have to figure out, are we moving to New York? Are we moving to Washington or are we moving out of this country? Because there's a hard bit of trauma that you endure when you have to pick up your life out of fleeing, when you are literally fleeing a place and trying to pick up your whole life. I don't want my child to grow up on the run. I'm also in Seattle, Washington, 
the, the, the men in the U-Haul truck, Idaho, just down the street. Do you think that that like people were not thinking about that this year? We walked in pride. I carried a Canadian flag because that was like my act of defiance down the streets of Seattle. And I've never seen pride so small since we moved it from Capitol Hill to, like 15 years ago. People are terrified to go out to pride this year. People were scared to show that they love another human being. That is the state in which we exist where people are so scared and trying to figure out where it is that we can live that with dignity, agency, ability to like not be terrified walking down the streets like this is 2022 and this is America. First of all, thank you for sharing all of that because it's brave in sharing. And, and I think it's important for people to understand because I'm having these, these conversations with friends who are asking me, um, will my disability benefits from VA work if I'm in another country? Right. Yes, they Can will. I get, right. Thank you. Mm. But, but folks don't know. Right. Can I get my GI Bill benefits if I go to another country? Right. Where am I going to get my health care? And it, it, these people are not seditionists. They're the opposite. Right. Like this is there's going to be some people who say, hey, if you want to fucking go, then go. But they're not understanding the reason why people are considering going is because this is a handmaid's tale moment. Where, where, you know, literally rights are being stripped around you as you're building a family, as you're existing. And I think that's an important humanization of these issues that people are still not fully grasping. Your wife is expecting. This could change during your pregnancy and your marriage could be voided and made illegal. Like that is fucking crazy um, and outrageous and un-American. And it's amazing that you're still fighting back. But let me ask you this. There's a lot of folks who are going to be listening who are in situations like you or have family members who are in situations like you um, who maybe are checking their passport, maybe have their backpack, maybe are moving to a different state. Um, I know you can't you know, tell them what to do, but as an activist and as a, a leader for this movement, what's your message to those people that are now you know, in some ways it's going to be like behind, it's going to feel like they're behind enemy lines. What's your message for them in this moment and in the next couple of months ahead, which look like they could be even tougher? First and foremost, get an attorney. Um, literally, that's what, you know, like all of us need to be doing right now is figuring out what are our rights. You know what? I mean, I was in a hearing just recently and, and I listened to a Republican, Republican congressman yell about how Roe v. Wade was, um, was actually empowering women and like giving them all the things. And I said, there's nothing more empowering than knowing your rights. And knowing your rights is the one thing that like will save us in our moments that we, as long as we know our rights, we have, we have more power than we think that we do. So one, know your rights, talk to an attorney, figure out how do you, how do you protect yourself and your family, your assets, your children, your marriage. Um, also too, like there isn't, it is okay to leave a state. I, I've been going through this back and forth and like, I'm a fighter. I cannot help but fight. But I also like living in America is inherently traumatic. If you live in communities that are oppressed, marginalized and targeted, you don't have to stay. You're not beholden to a state that does not believe that you have human dignity and the, and doesn't see you as a person. So if you are thinking about leaving and you're worried and you're feeling the like guilt and the shame of that, it's okay, walk away. And it's okay to stay and fight. And if you're gonna stay and fight, find your community, find your people and find a way to organize. Don't try to do it yourself because you cannot change the system by yourself. Don't be an activist, be an organizer. Be an organizer because activists only have one person. They are one person among many. Organizers have many people behind them and a solid message to, to move forward. So if you're gonna stay, stay and fight and organize with other people and find your people because the one thing that we cannot forget in this life is we fight like hell, but we fight for joy and we fight the, for the right and the, to experience that joy. So never forget that, that we are fighting for that joy. You know, I'm, it's, it's, it's like we're talking about the French resistance here, you know, and, and it's, it's what we see people in Ukraine having to deal with. But now it's here. Like this is our, our, our version of this next generation war. And it's for the soul of the American conscience and the body politic and our future. And, you know, you're, you're you know, we're talking about a resistance, like a political resistance. It's OK to leave, you know, um, to leave you know, the Donbass region and go back and consolidate, reorganize, find new ways to get your power and then come back later and take it back. Right. And I think yes. that's the long view that is hard to have, especially when you have children. I think I may have mentioned this uh, 
on Twitter, but you know, we, we, I wanted to go to pride this weekend and we've been to pride a lot with the kids. And my wife and I had a conversation she said, you know, we got three-year-old and it, you know, it's not just an attack. It could be a stampede. Like we saw people yes. saw fireworks crowds are now not safe. And, and especially crowds where there are gatherings of, 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 of gay people or minority people or any people is now a target. Like everything's a yes. soft target. So, and you can open carry in those places now too. Right. Thank you. Supreme right. court. Right. So to that point, I'm glad you mentioned it. Supreme Court just ruled before we got to recording uh, in the case of Torres versus Texas Department of Safety. Torres was a cop um, who, who sued uh, after being fired. He was a, he had a burn pit exposure. He's been on TV. This is a 5-4 uh, decision by the Supreme Court that, you know, they got Kavanaugh and I think one other to come over with the liberals. And then you've got Scalia, uh, Thomas and Amy, Barry, uh, Amy Comey Barrett and one other in the dissent. Alito. It's a five yeah, it's Alito. Thank you. It's a 5-4 decision. This is interesting because I said to you before we started recording, it's the one time where a conservative court might favor, uh, you know, a, a minority community because it's veterans. Right. It's like this weird blind spot where, OK, you can't get Alito, but you're going to get Roberts. Right. Right. On, on an issue of minority rights on, on, on uh, disabled people. Right. Um, this is a big fucking deal. Like it's a massive win for veterans, not just this generation, but Agent Orange and everyone else who has right. suffered because of a, a their service. Quick reactions from you on, on this decision. Um, you know, maybe it's a one good piece of news after a string of shitty ones over the next couple of months. But what's your immediate reaction, Lindsay, to the decision? So I looked this up and we, this law actually existed because of Vietnam. So it's like how it's good. The law dates back to like the 1970s to protect veterans because of the Vietnam uh, era veterans that were removed from their jobs. It's, a, it's actually quite interesting to me because I think um, being in the military, you know, the you know, the Ferris doctrine which protects the government from ever being sued for anything that any wrongdoing that they've done to service members and veterans. So I actually find it fascinating that now there's a state that set precedent that you can't discriminate against people or that you can't, that you can't dismiss people because of their veteran status and their disability status. So I'm actually curious to see if this will set up more ability for veterans to be able to leverage state um, state cases because we have no power when it comes to the federal government. So what happens from here, the trickle down is going to be really interesting. And it's also fascinating because the same folks that voted before um, were ones that wanted to make sure that folks in the National Guard didn't have to get vaccines. So like the level of like kind of cognitive dissonance of like and like the hypocrisy of it all is really surfacing mm -hmm. in the sense that like it doesn't make any sense that you are like anti-vaccine, but like pro these uh, like i just I it's, it's a really important in many ways it's, it's going to be the most interesting case out of the recent ones right because it was the least yeah. expected the least understood the least covered um but it also might be you know a, a pathway forward on some issues i don't know i mean <laughs> I mean, the, the no shit too is there's going to be a, a, like a torrent of, of cases now. Um, you know, the personal injury attorneys are going to be backing up yes. the dump trucks for, for huh. every single yes. case and veterans are all going to be throwing us out. And I worry actually about the backlash against veterans because it's going to yes. make them look litigious and, you yes. know, people aren't going to say it to their face, but they're not going to hire them because they're worried they could have a burn pit exposure that they have to accommodate. And it just, with a recession coming, it could be another cost that people don't want to undertake. So I think it's, it's a fascinating uh, moment. I know John Stewart's trumpeting it while we're also fighting on burn pits. Let me ask you to bring it back to center with a final question, Lindsay. And, and I know you've agreed to graciously stick around uh, for our Patreon members. So thank you to them for sticking through this episode. If we had technical problems, my apologies, Lindsay, you've been so, so enlightening. Uh, it's Independence Day. This is Independent Americans. Uh, you know, we say it's Independence Day, but it's also Independence Day. Um, you know, my kids and I were talking about it and I, I like July 4th. Like I love July 4th because I love this country and it's our country's birthday, right? And for me, it's always been a holiday worth celebrating, but this is a complicated time. And it's kind of like, I look at it like my kid. Like you might not like my kid, but I'm going to celebrate my kid the way I want to celebrate my kid because I own this flag too. And I own this country too. And in my own little orbit, I want to make it something that is, um, positive and that is unifying and it is about the future. And then for me in that orbit, it's about teaching my kids right. what it's about. Right. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on this independence day and, you know, the, the last independence day when you won't be a parent, um, you know, huh. and, you know everything yeah. else that's going on. 
uh, the July 4th has always been a complicated one for me, just in general, just um, I, ever since I got out of the military, just because military service was complicated for me. The last couple of years have been even more complicated. So uh, you're familiar with Vanessa Guillen, the murder of Vanessa Guillen. This is actually tomorrow. Can I hold on that for a second? Vanessa yes, Guillen was, a, was an active duty soldier that was uh, sexually murdered. assaulted and murdered at Fort Hood, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, her body was discovered two years ago tomorrow. Um, 4th of July, 2020, a group of organizers came together to create a justice for Vanessa Kia and grassroots campaign. We have spent, I mean, communities who have marginalized, oppressed, uh, brutalized, victimized, have been spending this Independence Day organizing for years. And I call on Americans to do the same. If you want this country to be what it says that it professes to be, spend 4th of July organizing figuring out how you're going to fight for Americans that are now marginalized, disenfranchised, disempowered. Spend your 4th of July fighting for this country because guess what? This country doesn't maintain its own freedom. It's maintained by people who continue to put the work in. So you love 4th of July? Spend the 4th of July organizing. F spend the 4th of July fighting for freedom. Yeah. <laughs> this is why... I hope you run for something. Uh, I really do. Like I have this vision of the future where you're in the Senate or somewhere else. And I think it's entirely, um, it's something we should all root for. I mean, again, you know, it doesn't matter where, what your party is. I think, you know, you're a voice that's cracking through and you're a conscience and you're the best kind of patriot. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of people cannibalize the word patriot. And I think there's an opportunity for, for leaders like you to reclaim it, especially in this moment. And I'm just grateful for you. I mean, leadership is so fucking hard and what you've been through is unimaginable, um, but you keep fighting and you keep inspiring and you're a personal hero of mine. And I'm so grateful that you've spent so much time today talking through so much. Um, you're also a wizard in, in being able to do it. Um, so thank you for all that you do. Uh, congratulations to you and your wife on the baby. Um, thank you so much. Ha happy pride. Uh, and I think it's a good transition to go from Pride into July 4th because we got to kind of take that energy and keep it going. And, and you're going to be on the ramparts for that. So you're one of my favorite Americans. Thank you for, for joining us on, on the show, Lindsay. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just so grateful for everything. Thank you. All right. So hopefully beers, fireworks. Maybe we'll go to a, a Seattle uh, Seahawks game sometime soon. Uh, the Seahawks would love it. Let's go. They're 12th <laughs> man. We're here for it. Let's go. All right. Stay vigilant. Thank you. Thanks.